Here now is former ATF agent uh, Matt Horace. He's joining me here in New York to talk about this. Uh, Matt, uh, it doesn't matter where you stand on the political divide of gun control in America, but when you hear that a person who was investigated by the FBI on two separate occasions for having possible ties to terrorism in one case and making inflammatory remarks in another, suggesting ties to terrorism, but then was able to legally purchase a handgun, and the key word obviously being legally. Uh, is that somehow a loophole that needs to be fixed or some, a loophole that was exploited? I can see why people might think that, but coming from my experience in government, I think it's important that everyone understand that those facts alone don't make people prohibited from purchasing firearms. And each time we have one of these incidents, we go back and analyze how and why the person was able to purchase. And in many cases, we find out that no matter what their conduct, behavior, or past was, some of the things didn't rise to the level of classifying them as prohibited persons and under those circumstances are the only ones that um, firearm dealers are not able to sell firearms to, to uh, citizens. And it's fair to point out that the FBI and the ATF both saying that those investigations were closed because yes. they didn't find anything more to justify uh, perhaps keeping the investigation yeah, open. You know, I think it's important to remember that the overwhelming majority of investigations that we initiate get closed out. And those are the ones that you never hear about. The ones you hear about are the ones where we make an arrest, we have an action, we execute a search warrant or an arrest warrant, or we maintain long-standing investigations. Most investigations, we look into people, we discount the information, we find out that it's not true and it's not credible, and we move on to the next. Uh, Matt, uh, for those people who may not be familiar with the various firearms that uh, are available uh, here in the United States um, to purchase legally, Describe for us uh, what an AR-15 is, what its capabilities are, because there are reports that, that he was armed with that type of weapon. All right, well, AR-15 is a military-type assault weapon. It comes in fully automatic or semi-automatic. I haven't heard any information as of yet to say that this gun was uh, functioning in a fully automatic capacity. But nonetheless, even in the semi-automatic mode, it can fire a lot of rounds in a very short amount of time. Uh, and, and so th th when you purchase it, it you're able to use that weapon in a fully automatic mode? No, no, no. What I'm saying is we don't know. We, have, we don't have any information right now to say that the firearm was used in the fully automatic mode. Therefore, it wasn't an illegal purchase or illegal possession. But even as a semi-automatic rifle, uh, it has the capacity to shoot a lot of rounds in a very short amount of time. Mm, okay. Um, so now let's talk about uh, what we may be learning now on Mateen, uh, the fact that he may uh, have pledged, uh, well, he, he did pledge allegiance to ISIS on a 911 call, but also the fact that uh, now ISIS may be claiming responsibility for this. Given that it's a sort of a very nebulous connection at this point, they've only, ISIS has just put out a statement or, or uh, there's been something on Twitter with regards to their uh, news agency. How difficult is it for federal uh, enforcement agencies to track people who may be thinking about doing something like this, but who are actually lone wolves and not necessarily having been trained by ISIS? Well, let's face it. We don't know what we don't know. And we've seen a number of times where people who would have been non-suspected have ended up being people to commit these sort of crimes. So in many cases, lone wolves, they, they're not um, visually or uh, optically maintaining their allegiance, and no one knows until an incident like this happens mm. and there's mass carnage and violence. So um, one of the things that people are going to wonder about is if you are active on the Internet, what kind of enforcement or what kind of technology is in place at the federal level to monitor people who may be using the Internet? Because that's what a lot of people are saying now, which is that ISIS is able to radicalize people just through the use of the Internet. They don't have to travel to Iraq. They don't have to travel to Syria to get trained, perhaps the way they might have, have to have done uh, you know, in years past. Well, remember, in law enforcement, we use reasonable suspicion and probable cause as a basis or a means to investigate people and try to determine what it is they're doing. Absent that, we can't just monitor people's electronics without getting enough probable cause to justify the issuance of search warrants and arrest warrants and things like that. So information alone may sound like it's enough, but rising to the level of, of uh, justifying court actions is a whole different, different ballgame. How difficult is it uh, for uh, law enforcement to... I mean, as you point out, there are a couple of things that can't be done. You can't monitor everybody's Twitter account. You can't monitor everybody's ISP address. Um, but when you understand the situation that we are in right now, where we are fighting this war with the Islamic State, uh, with jihadists, those who would attempt to try to kill American citizens, um, beyond the vigilance that 
individuals can do. What other uh, methods can law enforcement agencies use to try and prevent attacks like this? Well, I think, you know, ever since 9-11 and probably even before that, law enforcement agencies don't ignore the facts and the intelligence that were presented. So the FBI, all the other intelligence agencies will tell you that when they get credible information, they investigate down to the point where they're going to move forward or move backwards. Many of the cases result in closing investigations, and many of the investigations result in pursuing investigations. But absent that, we really walk a very fine line between making sure that we treat citizens as citizens and give people the rights that they deserve and enjoy here in the United States. Matt, I, I want to show some pictures to you and to our viewers as well. Uh, we're going to take you right now outside of Mateen's home. There you see investigators uh, that are essentially uh, parked out in front of his home. Tell us what they might be looking for. Well, they're, they're going to be looking for any and everything that will link him to this crime, not just figuratively, but evidence-wise. They're going to be looking for DNA. They're going to be looking for other firearms, ammunition, letters. They're going to be determining how many computers he has in his home, if he has iPads, how many cell phones. They're going to be talking to neighbors. But what they have to do is wait until you get a search warrant from a judge signed to say that you can go in that home and look for and seize those, those, those items. And the search warrants are very specific on what you can and what you can't seize. That's interesting. Um, so when you go to a judge and you ask for these search warrants, uh, what? So in in this case, what will they? I, I would think that they would want to be able to look at everything. Yeah, in this but case, it has to be specific. It, it, they may want to look at everything, but the warrant has to be very specific in terms of what you expect to find and what you want to seize as a result of your search warrant. Mm. And it's not very difficult in cases like this to make the case that there are 200 different things that might help investigators learn why this happened, who else may be involved, if there's anyone else involved, and what evidence we need to help justify and corroborate the information. I wonder also, Matt, there was a, an interesting um, moment during the press conference earlier today where the FBI special agent in charge asked uh, those patrons who were in the Pulse nightclub to reach out to the FBI, to reach out to law enforcement. And he said something interesting, which was that you may have seen something, but you didn't even know what you saw, and that's why we need to investigate. Um, take us through that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, we have to look at any and everything. Right now, I'd like to know how long was the suspect in the nightclub? Was he there five days in advance? Was he there the night before? When he came in that night, did he dance? Did he talk to people? Did he buy drinks? Did he look anybody in a different sort of way? So we want to determine all of that and more. And the only way you do that is by talking to each and every person who was in that club because everyone is going to have a different story to tell about what they saw or didn't see. And remember, this is just an incredible crime scene at this point. 50 bodies inside left to be evaluated, analyzed, and examined by the medical examiner, the coroners, coroner, police officers. It's a major crisis management undertaken at this point. Mm. Um, to your eyes, and I know the investigation is relatively new, but does this look to you like it was something that was meticulously planned? Well, you'd have to think so. I mean, particularly with the information that was provided by the, F by the ATF earlier, that the guns were purchased within a week, and then the incident happened a week later. Mm -hmm. So if the person didn't need or didn't want firearms prior to that, he bought them a week ago and then used them to commit this heinous crime. Absent that, we don't have any information out front that we know, but you have to be able to consider it. Mm -hmm. and, and being able to walk into a nightclub like this, I, I'm guessing there, there was a, a confrontation with a law enforcement uh, official before he walked into the nightclub. Um, but. It, just some, it does seem striking to some people that uh, in this day and age, in this very tight security day and age that we live in, that somebody would able to be able to get into a nightclub with, with an, a weapon like that. Right. Well, that's one element of this crime that we, we have to sort out. What happened during that initial confrontation when there was a shootout between the suspect and Orlando police? But let's face it, a suspect with an AR-15 going against a police officer with a sidearm, there is a, a little bit being outgunned there on the scene. But the question would remain, how did he get in? I would venture to say he got in during that in the initial confrontation in the gun battle. And we do have a picture of that, uh, that helmet that that police officer was wearing uh, during that initial confrontation uh, with Mateen. We can show that to our viewers. Um, and you can just see there's that, uh, uh, the damage done to that helmet. That Kevlar helmet, though, saved that officer's life. 100%. And that goes to remind us all of the dangers that law enforcement officers face each and every day. And in this case, that helmet saved a life, and that's why we wear them. 
for confrontations and conflict just like this. President Obama was also, uh, uh, he thanked the first responders, he thanked the law enforcement uh, officials uh, that uh, ultimately stormed into that club. Uh, and it is your estimation that in doing so, they probably saved a lot of lives rather than trying to wait it out to see what he wanted. Uh, it was a good move on their part. 100 percent. Listen, they didn't even know how many people had died at that point, but they knew based on cell phone calls from people who were inside that there were a lot of casualties and a lot of injured. So no matter what the situation is in terms of uh, negotiating with a hostage in a hostage situation, they had to end this violence and end it now, and they did exactly what they should have done.